Welcome to Talk Dizzy to Me, the show that brings you a comprehensive look into the complex field of dizziness. Now here are your hosts, vestibular physical therapist, Dr. Abby Ross and Dr. Danielle Tate. Welcome back to Talk Dizzy to Me. I am one of your hosts, Dr. Abby Ross, vestibular physical therapist and neurologic clinical specialist, joined today by my partner, Dr. Danielle Tate, also vestibular physical therapist. And we have a special guest joining us today, Dr. Jeff Walter. He is a vestibular physical therapist and happens to be Danny's mentor. Thank you for joining us, Jeff. Thank you so much for coming on. I don't know if Danny wants to admit to that, but... (laughs) Nice. Oh, I brag about surviving a 10 week clinical with Jeff Walter. Yes, I do. I do brag about that. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll just give a little background on, on uh, where I come from. I work at a balance center at Geisinger Medical Center and it's in central Pennsylvania. It's a level one trauma center. I work within an otolaryngology department. And so we have a balance center within that. I work with three ENTs that mostly just care about E, so otologists. I work with several audiologists and another physical therapist at our center. Uh, I've developed also an interest in teaching. I teach at Misericordia uh, adjunct faculty, so it's Scranton. And I've had an interest in teaching vestibular um, continuing education seminars to physical therapists and audiologists and OTs for 20 years. Now, today you brought us a really cool topic to talk about, which was eight helpful vestibular tests you may not know. And going down the list, um, if you've ever taken a weekend continuing ed course, you have never heard of these tests before. So I'm really excited to kind of dig in and talk about each one of them and when we would do them and what we would be looking for for each test. So the first one that you have listed is the HUM test. What is the HUM test? (laughs) Okay. So these are just some of these are just some (laughs) tricks I've learned over the years. Um, so when you have a conductive hearing loss, typically, for example, when we do a Weber test, a Weber will lateralize to the affected ear. Um, and if you have a sensory neural hearing loss, a tuning fork to the middle of the skull will lateralize to the opposite ear. So just a helpful screen. I've noticed this from doing actually an otologist told me about this years ago, but when I triage patients over the phone and we're trying to determine if they have an acute hearing loss, and if they do, whether it's conductive or sensory neural, and you're on the phone, a simple thing to ask your patient to do is to hum to themselves. So I want everybody to try something here briefly. Take your finger and shove your tragus down your ear canal, all right, and hum to yourself. You've created a conductive hearing loss. Where do you hear that humming? In the side of your your plugging, sorry. Hmm. So a real helpful thing on a phone with a patient to know if they have a, a sudden sensory neural hearing loss, which frankly is more sinister and can require otology involvement on a more timely basis is if the patient has a sensory neural hearing loss. So if the patient's telling you, I have left-sided hearing loss, and when they hum to themselves, the sound goes to the, to the ear that they feel like their hearing's reduced on they most likely have a conductive hearing loss. If the hum goes to the op- to, to the opposite ear, to your good ear, they most likely have a sensory neural hearing loss. So it's just a quick bedside, or even if you're on like a telephone encounter with the patient, to have an idea as to whether there's associated cochlear involvement and whether it's more likely to be conductive or a sensory neural hearing loss. So you just have the patient hum to themselves. Wow, that's really cool, especially with telehealth, too. Um, that's another yeah. test that you can kind of add to your toolbox for treating patients who you're just evaluating and getting an idea of what's going on. That's awesome. Right. So the next test, that's, that's test one. We're going to hit on eight here during this podcast. The second one is what we call, some of this is home cooked, by the way. So <laughs> you're not going to find these in textbooks. That's why the podcast topic is eight helpful vestibular tests you may not know, right? So it's called an ankle Weber. So we're still with the tuning fork. In subjects who have superior canal dizziness, or what we call a third window disorder. So remember, for normal hearing, we have the oval window and the round window, and that's how energy circulates through the human ear, through the cochlea to stimulate uh, auditory function. When you have a third window disorder, you interestingly can be extra sensitive to bone-conducted stimuli. 
So this is really reliable. I just found this in, in working. I work um, a bi-monthly clinic where we see patients who are suspected to have superior canal dehiscence. And a real simple test for a therapist to do is to take a tuning fork. Um, it's probably best if it's a 128 hertz fork. Vibrate it and place it. You can really do it on any distal bony landmark. So I just call it the ankle because that's the furthest away. So we put the tuning fork on the lateral malleoli. And in the vast majority of patients with a third window disorder, for example, superior canal dehiscence, they will feel that that tuning fork attenuates to their involved ear, mm -hmm. even though the fork's distant from them. So you can do it on their elbow. You can do it on their patella. But they reliably tell you that they feel like that sound attenuates to their ear. That's a pretty common feature with superior canal dehiscence. It's rare that that's negative. Now, so, what is the patient's reaction? Do they jump or, I mean, is it um, startling to them to, to feel it there? Most of the time, I'll just, I'll tap the tuning fork and I'll put it on their ankle and I won't say anything. And I'll just look at them. And about half the patients will just go, they'll just point to their ear. And if they're not saying anything, I'll ask them, you just feel like it's vibrating at your ankle? Or do you feel like that's going up and, and vibrating right into an ear? I don't want to lead them. So I, that's why I stay kind of open-ended when I started. But most patients will just sort of look at you and then they'll point to their ear when they have superior canal mm -hmm. They can feel that um, bone-conducted stimuli. Bone is an excellent, conduct, uh, an excellent conductor of vibratory forces. So patients are just, they're extra sensitive to internal, internal bodily noises like their heartbeat, they can hear their eyeballs move, the superior canal dehiscence. Uh, they can hear their heel strikes. So they're just very sensitive to any sounds that are reverberating within their body and vibrations well conducted by bone. So that's just a real simple test for a therapist to do when they suspect possible superior canal dehiscence in a subject is just vibrate. Take that tuning fork, vibrate it, put it right on their ankle. I'm trying to go over some tests that really don't require a lot of equipment. Well, it's nice. It's kind of like a bolstering test. So if you have your suspicions, the history sounds like there's other things that right. are there. You can kind Absolutely. of just say like it's another thing to just pad that that um, idea of what might be going on. Right. I like it. Exactly. Okay. Our third test is looking for rebound nystagmus. I just find that a lot of physicians and therapists aren't aware of this sign and it's pretty useful. So you probably really need video goggles for this test. So if you don't have video goggles, I think you have difficulty seeing it. It's not difficult to see with video goggles. So infrared video goggles. So there's a number of subjects that when they gaze, they can have nystagmus, for example, with right gaze, that's right B. And then with left gaze, it's left B. So it's more concerning when it's persistent because we all at ocular end range get a couple of beats of nystagmus and that varies from human to human, how long that'll last. A way to know if it's more sinister because we can also get gaze evoked direction changing nystagmus with central disorders is to look for the feature of rebound. And so you have your patient gaze to the right and hold and you see that they have right beats that are sustained. Hold it there for 10 seconds and ask them to return to primary gaze. And a real common feature in cerebellar nystagmus is this, the nystagmus will rebound. So that means if I had right beat with right gaze, when I come back to primary gaze, I get a couple beats of left beat nystagmus. And then when you gaze left, you have left beats that, that is sustained. And when you turn return to primary gaze, you get a couple beats of, of right beat nystagmus. So the nystagmus rebounds after lateral gaze. It's a nice way to sort out whether it's a more concerning gaze evoked nystagmus or the subject just has sort of a sensitive um, normal end range nystagmus. So we look for that feature of rebound to reinforce that a patient has cerebellar involvement. And that's with fixation removed, correct? Yeah, it's much easier to see with fixation removed. That's what I'm saying. You really need a mechanism yeah. to do the test with fixation removed. Now, Jeff, on the topic of gaze evoked nystagmus and the fact that we know a couple beats can be normal at end range anyway, um, what is your kind of deciding factor on, okay, this is abnormal for this patient or for any patient? With two features is, is it sustained and does it rebound? We really look for rebound. And when you look for rebound too, in that case, I'll ask the patient to gaze real, real strong to their right um, and hold it for 10 seconds because you see it better. If 
your real prolonged gaze holding out as far as you can. That rebounds more impressive when they come back to primary gaze. Normal end range physiologic nystagmus should not rebound. So I think looking for rebound is important. And if it's sustained, um, it's more likely to be pathologic than just normal end range nystagmus. So duration and does it rebound? Good. All right. Next. Four. Okay. Go to my list. This is just a simple one to look for. If you're in an ER type setting and you're tasked with seeing a Patients with acute dizziness in the ER, I think this can be helpful. If you're seeing a, uh, uh, an individual in the ER and you're concerned that they may have a more sinister cause of their dizziness, a simple thing to look for that's uh, not uncommonly present with pica distribution stroke, posterior, inferior, cerebellar artery stroke, is have the patient gaze right at your nose, clench their eyes shut. Um, it's not uncommon for patients with pica distribution stroke to have ocular lateral palsy. That means their eyes will drift towards their bad brain. And when they open up their eyes, they have to make a corrective saccade back to you. Hmm. So it's called ocular lateral palsy. So again, you're asking the, the, the patient to gaze at you. They clench their eyes shut. A positive test is their eyes will drift. And when they open their eyes, their eyes are over, just for example, right gaze, and they have to come back to you. So it's just looking for that corrective saccade, but we're not doing a head impulse test. You're just looking to see if a patient's eyes have a tendency to want to drift in one particular direction consistently. Again, so, so that's easy, called, no equipment. Yeah, right? so like that. right. And yeah. you could do it via telehealth. Yeah, okay. yeah, correct. Yep. So that's called ocular lateral palsy. All right. Number five would be mastoid vibration. So to do this test, you need the, the ability to vibrate a skull. Um, it should vibrate. The, the vibrator you use should be able to operate 100 cycles per second. I'm not here to commercially endorse any, but there's not many in rehab catalogs, but there's one sold. It's like the Hitachi magic wand, it's called. So we're going over how to use a magic wand here, which is really reassuring to your viewers, I'm sure. <laughs> but anyhow, you vibrate the mastoid. What's the purpose of that? Interest, I just find that it's underutilized. Danielle's well, well aware of it because she used it throughout her, her internship with me. But think of vibration as putting warm water in a patient's ear. Mm. So when we put warm water in a patient's ear, it causes vestibular excitation. And so you get nystagmus beating to the ear, you're irrigating with warm water. Interestingly, in a lot of sub, a lot of normal subjects, when you vibrate the mastoid bone, you get a little bit of vestibular excitation. This is another test where you would need goggles. Uh, if you're doing this in room light, it really wouldn't be valuable. You, you could really lose the sensitivity with the test. So this gets confusing. And I was really, when I started doing this test, I did it for like a year and was so confused, I stopped doing it. This is like 15, 20 years ago. And then when somebody explained it to me better, I started doing it more and it made more sense to me. So in normal subjects, when you vibrate their left mastoid bone, so we just vibrate right behind their ear. And sometimes you have to move the vibrator around to find kind of their sweet spot. But in, those sub in, in normal subjects, we usually get one of two things. When we vibrate the left ear, we get left beating or nothing, all right? When we do the right side in normal subjects, we either get nothing or right beating. So those are, that's just, if you get nothing on either side or you get right beating on right and left beating on left, that's considered a normal test. What's considered clearly abnormal is when you vibrate either side of a patient's head and your nystagmus is just always driven in one consistent direction. That's a really reliable sign of vestibular hypofunction. And it's so simple to do. Um, it literally takes 20 seconds at bedside to do. So we look for unidirectional nystagmus that's driven by the vibration. And regardless of what side you vibrate, the nystagmus is occurring in the same direction. Interestingly, that's, that the, you do not compensate for that over time. So if you had a hypofunction 30 years ago, or 10 years ago, or 50 years ago, you tend to flunk that test the rest of your life. So it's like wow. lasting vestibular luggage. Um, yeah. So that's one reason it's helpful. And it rarely lies about what side's involved. So it's really reliable on mapping out which side is down in function. We found that it's really useful in Meniere's patients. 
It's one of the few tests we can get them to flunk in between their attacks. So the most common vestibular test they tend to fail in our clinic is a caloric, but that's probably only 50, 60 percent. And then the other test they tend to fail probably more frequently is mastoid vibration. So it's a really useful test to look for hypofunction. Interestingly, there's, there's some cells within the utricle. Danielle was at a conference with me where this was discussed. We've never really understood the mechanism for it, but there are some cells within your utricle that are not embedded in the utricular membrane or, and don't have particles overlying them. And we think those are the cells that are driving the hair cells that are driving this response. So we think it's a utricular response, probably. Now, with the massive vibration for Meniere's patients, that is actually an excitatory response, correct? So if you vibrate and you get a positive or a, a abnormal result from your massive vibration, it's tending to beat towards the affected ear, correct? No, no, unaffected ear. Unaffected ear, okay. Yes, yeah, beats to the unaffected ear with Meniere's disease. Yeah, we it beats reliably towards the side of increased neural activity. Okay. And again, just to wrap that up, so if you test both sides and get nystagmus moving in the same direction for both side testing, it's a negative or it's a positive result, something abnormal. Bingo, Abby. Okay. Got it. It's a little cloudy. And this happens too, is sometimes we vibrate one with the left side and we get left beats that are pretty impressive. And then we do the right side and get nothing. To uh, us, it's a soft sign of right hypofunction, but it's more definitively abnormal when no matter what side you vibrate, you're getting nystagmus driven in one direction. But it is important when you, if you buy a vibrator to do this test with, it needs to vibrate at 100 cycles per second. There's some really nice work that's been done by Dumas, D U M A S. Um, it's a free access article on um, the status of using vibration as a vestibular special test. It's a really good article. But the emphasis was this response fades out. If you vibrate at a higher frequency and if you vibrate at a lower frequency, you're, so your peak responses are at 100 cycles per second. So make sure that whatever you're using to do the test drives it at 100 cycles per second. You tapping your hand behind your patient is not adequate. Uh, reasons maybe not to do the test is if your patient has a history of retinal detachment mm. and not to do it, although there's no documented cases of that causing retinal detachment, but I don't want to be the first. <laughs> and um I don't do it in patients that have a highly active BPPD history that I'm aware of, because I worry a little bit about actually jarring otoconia loose. I haven't seen that. Seen that uh, I haven't really seen that happen with patients, to my knowledge, but I, I'm not crazy about if the patient's 85 and osteoporotic and has had BPPD bilaterally recurrently about vibrating their skull. So patients often don't enjoy the test, but Danielle knows what the motto is in our balance center. Yes. Right, oh, yes. Oh, you do don't tell, do tell. Oh. Your comforts are secondary concern. <laughs> Fig figuring out what's wrong, figuring, now wait, the rest of it, this is the back of the shirt, figuring out what's wrong with you is our primary concern in helping you. So yeah. sometimes to figure out what's going on, you have to evoke some vestibular torture. But anyhow, your patient may be a little sensitive to that test just to warn you. I can respect that motto. <laughs> a lot of times when you do the test, as soon as it starts to kick in, they clench their eyes shut. So you got to work through that. So if you have this, to. This question is slightly off topic, but just anecdotally, um, when you were speaking of BPPV or recurrent BPPV and vibrating the mastoid, do you ever consider or ask patients about whether or not they use an electric toothbrush and if that has any impact on recurrent BPPV. I haven't, but I think it's a good point, Abby. I mean, there was a study that looked at liberating debris from the cupulas of, I think it was decapitated bullfrogs. And if you vibrate, it seemed to be an adequate stimuli to detach it from the cupula. Now with BPPV, it'd be detaching it from the otolithic membrane. I, I don't ask patients routinely about that, but we probably should. I do tell them that exposure to vibratory forces, in theory, might increase their risk of recurrence if they've been a frequent flyer. Mm -hmm. Usually if a patient's had a one-time episode of BPV and we treat it, I don't get into altering how they sleep or 
altering a lot of their activities until they become a frequent flyer because there are some patients that get like one isolated episode of BBD, you treat them, and then they're fine for years and years and years. So I don't like to restrict their activities until they become a, a patient where it's been recurrent. But I think that's a good point to talk to a patient about that if they are highly active with BBD. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Number six. Number six is the, the, these next several relate to DPPV. So a reverse Dix Hall bike. So I think most of your listeners are aware of a Dix Hall bike. So what's a reverse Dix Hall bike? What, what is a reverse Dix Hall bike? So when you're seeing a patient who's not responding to maneuvers or you think they may have cupulolithiasis of the posterior canal as an example, we put them back in a Dix Hall pike and they have upbeating torsional nystagmus. It just won't completely stop. It just persists. A nice little marker to look for to know if you're dealing with a heavy cupula is to have them sit up. Remember the nystagmus with cupulolithiasis doesn't reverse when you sit up, but it should reverse, okay, if they have it on the right side, right side of cupulolithiasis. If you turn their head right and have them bow forward, so I just have them put their kind of their chin towards their knee, Sometimes I jack up the table high to do this so that they feel comfortable bending forward and I hold on to them. So their head is turned 45 degrees right for a reverse right Dick's Hall Pike. And we basically just have them take a bow so that the top of their head is pointed towards me. I'm sitting in front of them. All right. So you're just bending forward and dropping their head down. If you think about that, if the cupula is truly heavy, the heavy cupula should billow towards the utricle. You should get utriculopedal displacement of the cupula with that test, and it should reverse what you saw with your, with your Dixall pike. So we look for, in the case of a right-sided ear involvement, we're looking for down the left torsion with a reverse right Dixall pike. Because if the cupula is heavy, you should be able to make it swing one way and then the other by using gravity. So it's just a helpful test to, for a therapist to know, yeah, you're likely dealing with a heavy cupula. But I want to warn you, you can also get this with a, re a reverse dick salt bike. If the patient has canalithiasis, doing it can also reverse the nystagmus because the debris gets jammed up into the, to the cupula when you bow forward. So it can reverse with canalithiasis also. So question, I tend to bring the patient up and um, bow them a little bit to see if I get a reversal of nystagmus. Do you only recommend it then if you are suspecting cupulolithiasis or would you recommend doing it all, all BPPV testing? I only do this reverse Dix Hall pipe when a patient doesn't appear to have cupulolithiasis. I would agree with what you said. When you sit patients, uh, I usually do a Dix Hall pipe see it and I like to see it reverse when they come up once unless they're very sensory sensitive and I'm worried they won't get through another Dix Hall pike and uh, uh, getting them through the universe. but as long as they're tolerant I do like to see the nystagmus reverse so with canalithiasis I would highly advise you sit the patient up and just like Abby said tuck their chin down a little bit to let that debris settle back down towards the cupula that's just looking for your reversal with canalithiasis. But with the reverse dick salt bike, you're taking that another 90 degrees down. Mm, okay. To, to really, if the debris is, if you're dealing, what you really want to know with cupulolithiasis is there's central disorders that can mimic cupulolithiasis. So for you to feel better that you're dealing with a heavy cupula, when you flip the patient's head 180 degrees from where they were at with their dick salt bike, does their nystagmus reverse? It should if the cupula is heavy. Frankly, the same skull position is the third position of your modified Epley's or Canal 3 positioning maneuver is also the same skull position when you think about it, where the nystagmus should reverse if you're dealing with cupulolithiasis. So Good. All right. Next up, number seven, is the half Dix Hall Pike. So half Dix Hall Pike. To understand this, I hope you can see I have an ear model here. Okay, I think you can see it. Mm -hmm. When you're upright, it's important to remember that your cupula sits at a 30 degree angle off gravity. So if your cupula truly has debris on it and it's heavy, when should you be in maximal agony? All right, so think about it. We're putting a patient back into a Dick's Hall pipe. I hope it's lining up right with the camera. Halfway back when the cupula's 
perpendicular to a gravitational force or the full way back when the cupola is almost becoming parallel with gravity. So, so I'm now just, degrees. what's that? Yeah, so about halfway when you're back about another 60 degrees to get that. Correct. To right. so that's why we call it a half Dix Hall pipe because when you think about it, when you're doing a Dix Hall pipe, you're dropping your patient back 90 to get them supine and then we drop them like another 20. So like 100, you're putting them, their head back 110 degrees because you're going 90 back plus you drop their head over the edge of a pillow or a bed. Um, so normally we're dropping them back 110 or so. 120 if you go 30 degrees back. So you're just stopping short there and just dropping them halfway back. I've really found this to be helpful when you're doing a full Dix Hall pike. And again, you have that patient where their nystagmus doesn't appear to completely abate. It just keeps going. A real helpful thing to do is from your full Dix Hall pike, just bring their head up halfway. And if you see that torsion accentuate, so we did a right Dix Hall pike, we saw upbeat right torsion that just doesn't completely stop. If you elevate their head halfway up and the torsion increases, you get more right torsion. It's clearly not cantalithiasis because the nystagmus isn't reversing, it's increasing. So that's a really helpful marker to let you know as a therapist, you're not dealing with cantalithiasis, that you may be dealing with a heavy cupula. So if nystagmus increases with a half Dix Hall pipe, that's a very common feature of cupulolithiasis. And then we can bring them into reverse Dix Hall Pike and make our case stronger. Amen. There you go. Yep, Amen. I, <laughs> I think a lot of those patients, actually, if you look at modeling, their debris on the utricular side of the cupula. Hmm. I haven't found. There's a lot that if we're honest with ourselves, I think sometimes I don't really think we're successful getting debris off the cupula because I think it's on the utricular side which is where it can end up after a maneuver too. When you do a maneuver, sometimes the debris can end up on that utricular side of the cupula. And that's why I think patients sometimes feel tipsy and off for a couple of days after their maneuver. Interesting, I just learned to leave it alone because it almost always just goes away on its own because there's concentrated dark cells. Dark cells are thought to degrade otoconium. And those dark cells are actually concentrated right around your cupula. So it's actually a good place just to let the debris sit and degrade probably. To let the trash compactor dark cells take care of them. So I've just learned to do nothing for it, to be honest with you, because it's usually self limiting if you just leave it there. Huh. But that gets in the treatment. All right, number eight gaze testing during positional tests. Okay, yeah. So I think this is helpful. Again, we're talking about. BPPV cases where you're not, they're not responding to maneuvers and some of the traits of their nystagmus is starting to make you scratch their head if they really have BPPV. So let's follow this a little bit. We bring a patient back into a right Dix Hall pike and they're in primary gaze. Primary gaze means that they're staring straight ahead. They should have straight ahead, meaning when they're back in a right Dix Hall pike, they're gazing, you know, at a 45 degree angle away from the ceiling. They're staring at where your ceiling meets your foot where your ceiling meets a wall. Their nystagmus should be upbeat and right torsional. You should see both components. It's important to remember that canal-related, canal-stimulated eye movements occur in the plane of the canal. So if we do a right Dix Hall pike, when an individual gazes left, the vertical component should be substantially stronger because now you have the eye right in line with the canal. So the vertical component should be stronger with the right Dix Hall pipe when you gaze left. And the torsion becomes much more impressive when you gaze right. So again, if you have a stubborn case, see if their nystagmus is more vertical with Dix Hall pipe testing when they gaze towards the ceiling and more torsional when they gaze towards the floor, because that's it should be if it's a posterior canal generated eye movement. If it's a brain generated eye movement that you're evoking, it won't follow that rule. In fact, sometimes the direction of the nystagmus will change when you do gaze testing in a Dix Hall pike. Now, what about so for horizontal? So, like with roll testing, will that also be something that you can look at? It's not as helpful uh, because the primary nystagmus with Roll testing we did is horizontal. So it will just increase in intensity when you gaze towards the fast phase, and it will decrease in intensity when you look towards the slow phase. 
but it doesn't help you as much, I don't think. So I do that gaze testing when I do Dick's Hall Pike testing. Yeah, to separate the two components of the nystagmus. And I'll also say, uh, Jeff, you can give me your expert opinion on this, but even if I don't remember, or as a newer clinician, if you want to input this into your practice, if you can't remember which way would bring out uh, more torsion or more of the vertical component, just do it anyway and see what you get. You right, know? true. I think the simple thing is remember, if you're gazing towards the ceiling, that brings out the vertical component. Mm-hmm. If you gaze towards the floor, no matter if you're in a left or right Dix Hall pipe, gazing towards the floor increases the torsion. Also, another way you can remember it is huh, always remember your posterior canal sits parallel with your earlobe. So if you're back in a right Dix Hall pipe and you're gazing out your ear canal, your ears like your, I'm sorry, your eye is really perpendicular to the canal. So you're going to get that torsion. If you gaze towards the ceiling, again, that eye is aligned with your posterior canal and you get the vertical component. It just has to do with how the eye muscles attach to the orbit. That's good. I like it. So here I'm curious. Um, do you, I mean, you probably pick and choose, obviously, which tests that you want to bolster your exam with, but at what point in your practice did you end up using these extra, I guess we'll call them tests? You know, these obviously weren't something you learned right off the bat. They came with practice. At what point in your practice were these things you started using regularly? Mm. I think the great thing about vestibular is that you can practice for, if you really delve into it, you're seeing busy patients all day, every day, and you really care about what you're doing. And you you find mentors and ask questions and read and listen to podcasts like this. You can really learn probably something new almost every day. Yeah, it just it just snowballs over time. If you're an active learner, I mean, if you're say if you're sitting back waiting to be spoon fed, you won't grow. But I think if you actively engage, I felt like the first ten years of my career, like I learned something little almost every day. And just you know, after you do it for ten years, you know a lot more. I That's learned right. something today. <laughs> That's why I like I like coming back up to Pennsylvania and spending a day with you maybe once a year just observing because usually you've always got little tidbits of information to kind of feed or new articles to look at or you've spoken to somebody else that's doing research in something that um, is kind of onto something new. So there's always something new to be learned because it is still kind of a new-ish field um, if you look at the grand scheme mm-hmm. of things, which is exciting. Yeah, I mean, it's so much more involved than when I started. I mean, I'm not a senior citizen yet, but when I started, it was, it was, uh, I mean, we were just learning what BPPV was and what to do for it, which I thought sounded crazy, which was maneuvering a patient's head around to get rocks out of where they were stuck. I thought it sounded ridiculous when I learned it in PT school and you know, it's not. So stay open-minded and stay, I think just advice would be stay curious. Like I think some of the best clinicians are curious and inquisitive and seek to learn. Like, yeah. And I'm sure Abby too. I just don't know Abby as well. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely like Danny though. Um, I have to say, when you think about the grand scheme of vestibular rehab in general, I had a patient this morning who saw his uh, general practitioner PCP and was told, you know, this is just something you're going to have to get used to. So just to know that that's still an answer that's being provided to patients shows you how much more as a whole healthcare system that we need to grow in this field specifically. Yeah. Or you have, you have fluid in your ear. <laughs> Drives me crazy. I want to punch them in the forehead when I hear that. It's so ridiculous. <laughs> uh, or you, uh, you stay, or your you station tube is the cause of your dizziness. That's the other one I love. So and you, can I also, cut that out of the po- you might want to cut the punch in the forehead out of the podcast. <laughs> I also, Jeff, uh, while we're on this eight helpful vestibular tests, maybe you could give a little plug for your paper that just came out. Oh, uh, yeah, we're going to do a podcast on that eventually. A uh, whole second episode on that. That's I'm I'm really excited to cover that because I know you're looking into that for a long time. Yeah. So we we looked at enhancing this. We thought we could enhance the sensitivity of a Dick's Hall pipe by doing what's called a loaded Dix Hall pike. 
So the paper that was published about a, I don't know, a month ago was a um, blinded trial looking at standard Dix Hall Pike testing in patients with known posterior canal BPPV and comparing it to kind of a hybrid version of the Dix Hall Pike called the loaded Dix Hall Pike. So it's just a modified manner in which to carry out your, your Dix Hall Pike testing, to, which we found to enhance sensitivity, increase the duration of nystagmus when you evoke posterior canal BPPV. Uh, the one negative is uh, patients don't. Patients became more symptomatic with loaded Dix Hall Pike testing versus standard Dix Hall Pike testing. So, if, again, if patient comfort is a chief concern, you may not want to do it. But if you want to see a positive test, I just had a patient yesterday. It was really interesting. He let me play around with it. He was 41. And it was really hard to evoke his posterior canal BPPV. Like he'd see, he said it, he could feel it coming on, but it just wouldn't quite kick off. And I really, really loaded him to try to get it to happen. And that's the only time I could get it. Um, huh. when standard Dix Hall, I just played around with it just to see, because he didn't care. But when I did a standard Dix Hall pike, I got nothing. And I only got it when I did a loaded test with him. And we had several patients in our study where it only kicked off when you did a loaded Dix Hall pike. And it wouldn't kick off when you did a standard Dix Hall pike. So we found the sensitivity of the test to be around 95% when you do a loaded test. And it's and this is consistent with other literature. When you do a standard Dix Hall pike test, it's about 80%, which is the same thing we found. That's, That's really so cool. interesting. I think it was last episode I was talking about a patient who her history, I mean, just screamed BPPV. Aside from her age, I wasn't really suspecting BPPV at first, but I couldn't elicit anything that eval. So, you know, I told her, let's get kind of a more standard program going, get you comfortable with movement again. And lo and behold, that night she called me at two in the morning saying it's happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I wonder had I done a loaded Dix Hall Pike, maybe I would have gotten the result yeah. that I was looking for. I've just, I think the other thing I've learned through the years is there's a lot of patients that come to you for one visit and they have trouble showing off and it, reassessments <laughs> are really helpful. Uh, just from being at the same institution forever, you often see like patients that were sort of mysterious to you that you weren't sure what was going on and you found something else with their exam that you got too excited about. A lot of them just have recurrent BPPV and they just didn't. When they were there for their appointment, it just wasn't active because we know depending on how the debris is dispersed within the canal, some of it degraded, how it moves within the canal when you test a patient, um, they may not always show off. So. I guess just the teaching point is don't be afraid to do reassessments on patients. Right. And get creative. A lot of times if I get through, I'm doing the loaded Dix Hall Pike and I'm doing all these different positional testing and I can't evoke anything, I'll tell them, show me what makes you dizzy. Yep. Watch you pretend you're in bed, roll over, do whatever you need to do. Show me what makes you dizzy and just get creative with it. That's yep. the ninth helpful vestibular test. You won't read in a test. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we'll go over that in more detail on a, on a podcast. Yeah, we Good. can dedicate a whole episode to that, which I'm really excited about. What's really interesting is the mechanics behind it, because it really spurns from a study that um, really unveiled why BPPV fatigues. So if you really understand that study, it makes sense why the loaded Dix Hall bike would be more sensitive. So we'll go over all that in another podcast, because that's like a 30, 40 minute talk. Well, consider that an official teaser for another podcast in the near future. <laughs> <laughs> I also just right. have, some new, I have some new courses coming out on MedBridge. Actually, I was up till 1.30 last night doing that. Um, they're in the final stages of editing. So if anybody's interested in vestibular continuing education on MedBridge, there's going to be a 10-part course series released probably within the next month or two. Um, if you're interested. On a we'll, we'll be sure to. Danielle makes an appearance on one of them. I do. We'll be sure to post um, the links to that in the show notes, especially when that becomes updated. And you can also find that on vestibular.today under the continuing education um, tab, where we list a lot of different courses that you can find if you're looking or interested in finding more information on where to look at Jeff's lectures or other clinicians' lectures for vestibular therapy. But thank you so much for coming on today. This was sure. really, really great. And I think people are going to take a lot away from this podcast. So I'm really excited to get this one up and going. Yes, thank Great. you. Thanks, Abby. Thanks, Danielle. If you're interested in finding us on social media or the web, 
You can visit www.vestibular.today for more resources, including testing, treatment, and educational videos, blogs, continuing education classes, and resources including clinic equipment recommendations, suggested tests, and BPBV treatment charts. Search Vestibular Today and Balancing Neck Rehab on all social media platforms, including Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Also, be sure to check out Balancing Act Rehab at www.balancingactrehab.com, especially if you think you would benefit from vestibular therapy. We are your girls. The information on this podcast is not intended to replace the care provided by your qualified health professional or to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on Talk Dizzy to Me. Please contact us at Balancing Act Rehab if you think you could benefit from vestibular therapy.